Hi, I'm Dan Gardner, and I talk about traumatic brain injury recovery. And today I'm pleased to have neuropsychiatrist Mohammed Ahmed speaking with me. Traumatic brain injury recovery. Please like, subscribe, and comment on this video. Welcome, Mohammed. So, is it okay with you if we start by your telling me about your background? and how you got involved in the area of traumatic brain injury. I did my med school in India, then I came here, did my residency training at Wake Forest University in a psychiatry program with a focus in neuropsychiatry. So that time during one of my rotations in the acquired brain injury unit, I came across a veteran who had a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. He was in the rehab unit. He had severe injuries to the point that he needed a brain surgery. We were trying to improve his functional outcome. He refused to cooperate for the rehab. And when we asked him why, he said he didn't have a problem. He thought that he uh, didn't need rehab and there's no, nothing wrong with him. He was unaware of his deficits. Exactly, exactly. It was intriguing to me as to how can somebody with such severe deficits say that he doesn't have a problem? He couldn't walk properly. So there was this scientific curiosity that was starting to happen in me about what is this phenomena. And so I started doing some scholarships looking at this phenomena. And I soon found out that it's nothing but a lack of awareness, which can happen in TBI. It happens in people with stroke. Sometimes they are unaware of their deficits in one side of their body. Uh, it can also occur in uh, neurodegenerative disorders like frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's, where people are not aware of their cognitive deficits like they're not aware that they have a memory problem. A lot of people come to you and they say, well, they don't have a problem, but the spouses say, no, no, he's forgetful. This was nothing dif different. This was something very similar occurring in mild TBI. So yeah, that's how I naturally got dragged into it. From then on, it's been a journey. Good. So tell me, what does neuropsychiatry mean? What does a neuropsychiatrist do? Yeah, so it's a very uh, interesting integrated scientific field which uses expertise from both psychiatry and neurology. And there's the American Neuropsychiatric Association which defines it as a scientific field integrating psychiatry and neurology. And traumatic brain injury is a very classic example of a neuropsychiatric condition because you have neurological event, which is the brain injury that leads to a neuropsychiatric syndrome that has symptoms from uh, migraine headache, dizziness, vertigo, Psycho, uh, gait issues, all the way to cognitive deficits, memory issues, uh, depression, anxiety, emotional liability, sleep issues, thereby causing functional impairment. So this is a perfect example of a neuropsychiatric syndrome where you have both neurological and psychiatric symptoms. Right. So as a neuropsychiatrist, if I came to you as a brain injury survivor, how would you evaluate my condition? So I believe in the old school method of proper evaluation, history taking. I think clinical evaluation is the best diagnostic tool we have to diagnose somebody with TBI. Obviously, we do have some tests that we can do to confirm some few things like a neuropsychological testing to characterize the cognitive impairment one has. Sometimes we often get uh, neuroimaging studies like MRI with a certain kind of a sequencing that helps us identify some injury in some of the tracks of the brain. I think the first and foremost method is understanding the syndrome. Although we know that the constellation of the post-concussive syndrome are same, but it, there is some degree of variability among individuals. I believe that no two injuries are the same. For example, somebody with a post-concussion can have largely migraine headache and sleep difficulties and may not have any problems with depression or anxiety or cognitive issues. Whereas you have this other person who may have completely different set of symptoms such as depression or emotional liability. They cry easily. They have difficulties with sleep and they can't cope up with their day-to-day -day activity. So, so I think clinical evaluation is the first step to understand right. what is the injury, nature of the injury. So if two people have a similar impact but have quite different resulting problems, what's that about? Yeah, that's very interesting. That's something that we don't know. We don't know why one individual has a certain different set of symptoms versus the other. I think the answer probably lies in the physics of the injury, the mechanism of the injury. For example, you know, like now we know that like from the veteran studies, soldiers who were exposed to the blast wave who'd never had a head impact have symptoms of concussion and they have neuroimaging changes on the brain, sometimes they, the presentation could be slightly different than, you know, somebody with post-concussive syndrome after like some football or uh, in a form of football players have the clinical syndrome of possible CTE or now we call it the test, tra uh, traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. So I think right. mechanism of injury may have something to do with that.
And uh, I think it's important to pay attention. I mean, I can give you a very classic example. I saw a patient recently who is a very high fun. He actually trains uh, lots of these executives and leadership qualities and high education level. So he had a TBI in a different country where he was in a Jeep and the Jeep, I think, hit some rock or something and he went right up. So he hit this upper part of his skull. After that, he had the classic post-concussive syndrome. One of the cognitive impairment he has is he couldn't draw the clock. He oh. had a neuropsych testing done and he had difficulties with clock and some visual spatial difficulties. So, you know, when we put all the, looked at the MRI and, uh, you know, looked at the neuropsych testing and collected all the clinical symptoms, it looked like he had injury to the parietal lobe. And if you look at it, the mechanism makes sense. He went right up. Probably that's where parietal lobe is and the likelihood of having a parietal lobe injury. Is. So I think uh, one has to factor in the mechanism of injury, which is very important to the clinical evaluation. Okay. So you're talking about in evaluation, you take a thorough history and you could do neuropsychological testing. Do you do that or does somebody else do that in association with you? It's done by my colleague. She's a neuropsychologist. We have two of them. And then they are actually trained in that. So they do the neuropsychological eval. So you take into account their report, your clinical history, any imaging that you do in order to make a diagnosis. Absolutely. And then how does a neuropsychiatrist treat a brain injury patient and how does a neuropsychiatrist facilitate the recovery. Yeah, so one of the things of which a neuropsychiatrist has a slightly different advantage, say a neurologist treating TBI, I would think would be is the ability to understand the psychiatric part of the syndrome, especially mm -hmm. the depression, the emotional liability, parsing that out, and also with the psychopharmacological. So I think that plays a huge factor into this because you are not only diagnosing, but also you have to learn how to manage the symptoms. For example, parsing out emotional liability from depression or anxiety because the treatments could be quite different, mm -hmm. such as like, you know, if it is a pseudobulbar affect, then you probably want to try something like new Dexta versus trying something like an SSRI for depression. So I think uh, that is the role a neuro neuropsychiatrist will play. There is a second thing I would like to state as, given my training, I trained in traumatic brain injury and I also trained in memory disorders with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And given what we know that TBI is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, there is a small advantage if you are having a background in memory disorders. Because remember, when somebody has a TBI, they have two things. One is, can somebody help me with my symptoms? Second is, can somebody answer the question, what is my risk for Alzheimer's or CTE in the future? So it depends on, of course, what are the risk factors they have and what's their age. And that could be a valuable training in terms of addressing both these concerns among people with TBI. Absolutely. So, Mohammed, could you give me some specific case examples about patients that you've worked with or that you are working with? I did my training at the VA hospital for memory disorders along with, and also was a faculty of UCSD. Kaizen Brain Center, where I practice now, is a private clinic that addresses uh, both TBI and Alzheimer's and related mm -hmm. disorders. So here we treat anybody who have post-concussive syndrome or who have the concerns for CTE or maybe Alzheimer's or anything like that. So let me give you example of different stages of the concussion. Let me give you a case of a post-concussive syndrome where somebody have a concussion and they're going through the whole gamut of symptoms with concussion. So clinical evaluation leads me to understand the nature of the syndrome and also understand what is the driving factor in the syndrome. Is it the cognitive deficit? Is it the sleep issue? Is it the depression? Or is it the emotional liability? Understanding this is important because they have so many symptoms. There's really not, you can't use multiple in interventions to target every symptom. So understanding the driver in that whole cascade of symptoms is important. Let's say if it is depression. So one of the things that we have actually done is using neuromodulation approach to treat depression after a concussion, and that is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's called TMS. Mm -hmm. So we have been doing this for the past two years. We've been quite successful in treating a lot of people with the post-concussive syndrome with neuromodulation. We found that we had a much better response with the depression that occurs after a TBI because depression that occurs with a TBI is quite different from a depression that occurs without a TBI. These are two different things that happen. And we've done that for the past two years and we've presented our posters at the Boston University CT conferences. That's something we have made a huge impact on, a large percentage of our population. Mohammed, could you explain to me what neuromodulation is and what TMS is? So TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. So basically what it means is, so we place a magnetic coil over area of your scalp, targeting a certain brain region that we find is not working properly. 
after a concussion based on your clinical evaluation, your MRI, your neuropsychological testing, and other, other tests. And uh, the purpose of this treatment is to improve the neuronal connectivity so that the neurons can talk once again. So what happens after a TBI is that there is an axonal injury. Because of that, the neurons, which are the cells in your brain, they don't talk to each other. By doing TMS, we are hoping that they start talking again, thereby causing what is called as neuroplasticity. Thereby, your symptoms are improved. So this is a magnetic field that goes through the skull. This is not an invasive procedure. Absolutely. Good point. So it's absolutely non-invasive and painless. And there's no pain at all. And we do it every day. It lasts for about 30 minutes, under 30 minutes, depending on the protocol we use. And five days a week, depending on, for about four to six weeks. So the potential benefit is an improvement in the depression. What about side effects? Yeah, it has absolutely no side effects, virtually absolutely minimal. So the only side effects are some degree of headache. Initially, when we start doing it, it's largely because of some muscle twitches that goes away with one or two doses of Tylenol and people get oh, really? used to it. Yeah. Hearing is uh, some problem with the hearing could be side effect which because the machine makes some noise. But we give earplugs, so we've minimized that. Those are the pretty much side effects. The other side effect, which is a risk of a seizure, it's only theoretical. It's very low, though. People with a TBI have a slightly high risk, but we have learned how to do that safely here at Kaizen Brain Center by using a neural navigation system. We know exactly, we have a technology which tells us where to target precisely, avoiding the lesions. So that's how we have been quite successful in avoiding any side effects and getting better outcomes. I see. Now, you mentioned that the TMS is helpful in improving depression. What about cognitive impairments? Does it work for that as well? I believe so. I think as a secondary outcome, it, uh, it improves cognitive outcomes too. Within our people, uh, within our patients who we have treated, we also found an improvement in their cognitive functioning. Their thinking is much clearer. Their attention span is much better. As a result, they've improved their academic performances or they've improved their uh, performances at work. So I know this is probably a hard question to answer, but how long is the improvement lasting? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Uh, let me tell you, I think we are one of the very few centers who are doing TMS for post-concussive syndrome, keeping the standards that we stating. We are measuring a lot of variables and uh, keeping absolutely high levels of standards. And we are actually publishing our data so that we can learn and share the information. So there's really no data for me to give you a good answer. But if you look at the data from the depression, you know, where they use, it's and where it is used for a long, long time, I think it can help with the remission for at least from six to eight months. So like I said, the depression from a TBI is different from a regular depression because depression now with TBI has things like impulsivity, emotional liability, a little bit of mood fluctuation. And it's largely due to a biological event, like a mechanical injury. So there is some degree of contribution. So I think what we have done is we feel that people with TBI need a maintenance. So we kind of like, depending on the clinical evaluation and how they do on the first round of treatment, we sometimes do maintenance depending on once in like three months or once in six months. So far we have done that. And within our data set, we've not had anybody relapse. You know, the, the TMS is approved, FDA approved for depression. And and it is covered by most of insurances, including TRICARE and Medicare. So I think some of the costs can be taken care of by the insurances. The only difference is that we have a little slightly different protocol that is not the standard protocol for depression. So what happens is sometimes we request the insurance say, this is our protocol you know, for concussion. We've used it. We found this to be much effective than the traditional protocol. Can you approve it? And sometimes we get yes, sometimes we get no. So that's a struggle that we have. Yeah, that's a challenge. Talking about challenges, tell me in your experience working with traumatic brain injury survivors, what are some of the biggest challenges and what are some of the biggest satisfactions? So if I have to sum it in one word, I would say humbling. Dan, I've been part of the TBI since 2008, since I've been trained. I trained at various levels in TBI. You know, I did my fellowship in TBI and also uh, besides the fellowship, I, a lot of bulk of my training came from treating the veterans of the war and the VA hospital system, which has one of the finest structure for TBI. It, they have a polytrauma care system, as you know, and where people at different centers are different levels of care. I've looked, understood TBI from the prism of a neurologist, psychiatrist, and, or a physiatrist, like a physical medicine rehab person. Whatever I know about TBI today, I would say it's because of the patients I've seen. They have actually taught me more than anything else. So, so it's very humbling. 
as you know, it's a hidden injury. When a lot of people come to you and you actually address them, listen to them, understand their symptoms and clinically evalu- do a proper evaluation and tell them what you really think, they are very, very grateful to you. And the main thing they say is, you understand what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Because I've gone to so many people, they don't know what I'm talking about. It's nice to feel understood. Yes, it is nice to feel understood. And I think that's what it is. I mean, I've I've professionally, I've understood TBI, but I've had TBI for somebody who, personally, some family members. And, you know, then you realize, oh my, there are symptoms that are hidden. Just because we can't objectively measure doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. They teach you, your patients teach you. So it's, it's been very humble. And it's also been very enriching experience. You understand that every individual is different. So their injuries are different. The way they respond is different. The way they cope with that is different. So it's nice to make a contribution like that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mohammed, I want to thank you for taking the time to share what you do with me and for your efforts and working with patients, including some of my patients. Thank and you. so I want to thank you for talking with me and I wish you the best. I hope you like this video and please let me know in the comments what questions you have and what other topics you'd like me to discuss.